Good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are, everybody. I hope you're having or have had a fantastic day. I would like to welcome you to the second live stream for the uh, referee rules changes. Just turn my stream off on the app because I had a live chat open. Um, yeah, so the second part of the rule changes, the first half we covered uh, sections one through um, to the end of four. Uh, which can be found on the same channel as you're watching this on uh, as a video. All the live streams go up as a video soon after, as soon as YouTube can upload it. So if you do miss it, not a problem. So if you have to skip out of this one, you can always come back and watch the rest of it. Um, and I say if you missed the first one, you can go back and watch it. So this is the second half. This will cover sections five through to ten. Uh, we're not going to cover the appendices or anything like that um, because everything else is done in the middle of the rule book. So there's a couple of important links down in the description of this um, video. The first one, if you're watching this as a video rather than a live stream because you've missed it, um, there is a link to a form to ask any questions that you might have, which the gameplay department will answer at some point. Um, we'll, be, we'll be presenting it as whether a pre-recorded video or a live stream or a PDF. We'll decide that down the line. It depends on how many questions we get and the availability of some of the staff that we have. And the second one is when the code comes up for this live stream, please, please make sure that you register that code so that we know you've watched it and um, it helps you towards the next rulebook cycle. All the details can be found in the referee certification policy. So without further ado, let's jump straight into the rule changes. So we're starting off in section five, which is third bludger interference. Um, yeah, if you have any questions throughout this live stream, uh, live stream viewers, please, please, please use the live chat. We have uh, MCP Michael Clapponer, our rulebook team manager, um, who is having a look at the live chat and answering any questions that people may have um, as we go along. So smaller questions will get asked. If there's a big question that comes up, then he'll interject and we'll have a bit more of an in-depth conversation about it. So anyway, moving on to 551, which is third blunder interference. So the first thing we're going to kick off with is a clarification. And the clarification is that to trigger this um, rule, one team must have possession of both bludgers at the same time. So there's been examples where, um, this example here, so Green Beater A has a, has a bludger in their arm and there are two on the floor. Green Beater A then throws their bludger back to their own hoops. So all three are now loose. Then their beater partner picks up one of the two on the floor and throws it back. And then the first beater picks up the other one um, from the floor and throws it back again. Now this is legal because they were never in possession of two bludgers at the same time. So third bludger interference can't be called here even though they've throw interacted with all three without the other team interacting with one. So just a clarification. So on to the changes. So the rule that now says play must be stopped in order to adjudicate the penalty for third bludger interference. So it's now not just tried to be done in open play. And it is now done under the delayed penalty or advantage procedure as appropriate. So if the head referee sees it and there's no advantage to be gained to either team, they can stop the game straight away without having to follow, um, without having to throw their marker down or an assistant referee playing delay penalty. So it can be delayed, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so the summarized extra guidance would be that the penalty has changed. The back to hoops and the double bludger turnover remain the same. So the person who committed the interference is sent back to hoops and both bludgers are turned over. Um, now the quaffle is also turned over as part of this. And also the penalty card procedure applies. So scores are negated. So a goal and a catch for that team are now negated in the same way that penalty cards would negate them. Uh, we move straight into section six. Uh, the helpless receiver section has ever so slightly changed. So... Um, again, we're going to start off with a clarification first, which is that a receiver who is in the process of attempting to catch a ball that is in the air is, is considered a helpless receiver. So to be considered a helpless receiver, the focus must be on catching the ball. However, they do not need to leave the ground. They could be stood still um, waiting for the ball. But if their focus is on catching the ball, they are still deemed a helpless receiver. And the second point is that they do not need to be moving either. They could be stood still or they could be on the move. So that is what um, stipulates a person being a helpless receiver. And we've slightly tweaked the um, wording to make it easier for people to judge when uh, someone is no longer a helpless receiver. 
So an airborne receiver remains helpless until their legs have absorbed the shock of the landing after either gaining sole and complete possession of the ball or abandoning the attempt. So if they jump up and they either catch it and they retain it or they it goes way over their heads and they give up the attempt to catch the ball, they need to land and have absorbed the shock of a landing. So this guy here jumping off the step, the, he has absorbed the shock of the landing when they're at the bottom of the squat and they're beginning to stand back up again. So if I try and time it to about that point there, there again, so at the bottom of the squat and they're, they are beginning to stand back up, they, are, they have absorbed the shock of the landing. So it is your judgment as an assistant ref or a head ref um, as to when someone has absorbed the shock of the landing. However, please bear in mind that exaggerating the motion of absorbing the shock so, for example, if in this example with the person here, so they get to the bottom of the squat, if they then just continue to keep going to exaggerate the motion to try and basically immunize themselves from being able to be beat, they are still eligible to be contacted because they have already absorbed the shock of the landing and they are in control of that motion. Um, so hopefully that will be done a little bit more consistently with the new wording. Uh, moving on still through helpless receiver. Um, another clarification on incidental contact. So incidental contacts that result from attempts to play the ball shall not be penalized under this rule. So if two players go up and if one person is waiting for the ball and the defender comes across and tries to either swat it out the air or catch it or intercept it or do something to it and they accidentally contact the player, then it shall not be penalized as it will be ruled an incidental contact. However, they can't try and work around it by directly applying to apply, attempting to apply force to the receiver and pretending to go for the ball because then it will still be ruled as non-incidental. So contact with a helpless receiver is not necessarily illegal. It depends on the intention. If the intent, main intention is attempting to play the ball, that's absolutely fine. It's legal. If their main intention is attempting to contact the player and the secondary um, action is contacting the ball, then that is when it becomes illegal and the normal helpless receiver penalties will apply. So, moving on to 619, the initial point of contact. This is one of those ones where it's only just wording that have um, affected this. There's no change to the actual rule itself. So, before it used to be 180 degree flat plane, uh, sorry, 180 degree plane, and it now refers to the naval line as a flat plane. Um, it only affects the wording the meaning and the implementation in game is still exactly the same. So moving on to egregious contact. Uh, egregious has now been given an official definition in the appendices because of the differing uh, meanings in different languages uh, and from different cultures. So egregious is now defined as shockingly bad. And this re still refers to illegal actions. So things like contact or uh, interactions with a ball or another player or something like that they are still defined that is now defined as shockingly bad so it doesn't refer to anything extra than it did before still refers to those same actions as before so 623 one of the uh, newer topics and clarifications in here uh, regarding dunking so i'm going to go over what the rule book says first so it is illegal for a charging player's feet to completely leave the ground while applying the primary force of a charge unless that player has left their feet as a part of a direct attempt to pass, shoot or otherwise throw a ball. So effectively that basically means that you cannot uh, leave your feet to charge another person unless your the reason you've left your feet is to attempt to pass or shoot or throw a ball. So the normal situation is when a player is running through on the hoops, they've just got the keeper to beat, they jump, they try and jump up over to get that leverage and throw the ball through the hoop. So the extra guidance, uh, oh, still got a little bit extra here. So the player does not actually need to throw the ball in order to have been ruled to have left their feet as part of a direct attempt to throw the ball. So for example, if the player has their arm out with the ball in it, ready to jump up and over and shoot, even if they don't shoot, that's absolutely fine or pass or throw. That's absolutely fine even if they retain possession of the ball because there was an attempt there. If they have the ball tucked in somewhere in here, um, like in their midriff, they go up, they make the charge, and then they just carry on. There's no attempt 
to throw the ball there. So that is when it becomes illegal. Um, so because the charger gets a little extra leeway with the, they don't need to throw it as long as they're in the motion of it, uh, or they have the ball ready to. If somebody does go in with the ball tucked into their midriff or their chest, to do that and they think, oh, I need to make it look like I was going to throw it. So they make the charge, and then after the contact's made, they bring the ball out. That's a still a no-go. So that's them just trying to circumnavigate that rule. So the extra guidance we're going to give is that reckless and egregious attempts at dunk, at a dunk can still be penalised. So if somebody jumps up, ends up kicking the keeper in the face or something, you'd still penalise it under reckless or egregious as you see it. However, one of the main points that we need to stress that dunking itself is not reckless or egregious. You need to set your line that so that dunking by default is legal. It's just extra reckless or egregious attempts then become illegal. Um, and the other thing is because uh, dunkers aren't a helpless receiver because they're not receiving a ball, defenders may tackle dunkers even if they are in the air. However, they are still subject to the normal contact rules of they can't tackle below the knees, they can't tackle high, they can't make contact to the groin. Um, so hopefully that clears anything up with dunking. So moving on to shielding, which is 712. Just bring it up on there. So shielding, this is just a clarification. It's uh, always been this way. It's just a case it hasn't had a set space in the rulebook, so it's now been given a set space. So what is shielding? Shielding is the act of placing in your body in such a way that it blocks a bludger, normally intentionally. So basically a chaser getting in the way of a, a bludger um, to stop it hitting and like their cough or carrier or their beta or something. So it's completely legal um, provided it's done within the boundary. So what makes it illegal? So if the bludger is dead or made live by a teammate, it is a blue card. If So that would be if the bludger is knowingly dead or knowingly made live by a teammate. So if the person who is shielding knows it's hit the floor or gone out of bounds or it's been propelled by a teammate, then it's a blue card. If you do not believe that they're reasonably aware that it's been it's dead or been made alive, so they haven't seen the bounce or they the balls come from behind them, then it's no harm, no foul play on because they didn't know. Um, you cannot contact a bludger whilst it's held as a chaser or a keeper, so a corporal player. Um, so if the beater is about to throw it, you can't then put your hand on it before they've released it. Uh, you cannot interfere with the beater themselves as a as a coffle carrier, uh, sorry, as a coffle player or a seeker. Um, and also, if you're letting the bludger hit them, you have to let it hit you. You can't otherwise try to propel it. So if it's coming in at me and I'm a chaser, I can't then hit it away like that. That would still be deemed uh, illegal under the swatting rule. Um, drives. So still in section seven. So slight change. So what the rulebook says is that a new drive, uh, sorry, a drive ends and a new drive begins for the same team when the defensive team is assessed a penalty card or third bludger interference penalty. So if you've got green versus orange, green team have got the ball and orange team are assessed a penalty. Um, when that penalty has been assessed and the card's been given and the game restarts, they get a new drive. So that means even if the offensive team has used their legal reset, they will get it back again. So if in that same scenario, green versus orange, green have had the ball, they've legally reset it once, the referee's called reset used, they're pushing up the field again, orange team then get assessed that penalty, they then get that legal reset back. So at some point during the next drive, they can legally reset it again. And also, because it is a new drive, they may reset it immediately without it counting as a reset, provided that it follows the left game rules. So theoretically, you could get uh, in that green versus orange, as soon as green take it off orange, they could reset it straight away over both lines without it counting as a reset. They can then go up, legally reset it back, come forward again. A penalty then gets assessed against orange team, so their drive starts again. They can immediately reset it again, come forward, and then legally reset it again. So theoretically, you could get four without actually losing the ball, or even more if the orange team then commit another card. Chances of that happening, not very often, but it is very useful to know. Um, however, the new drive starts when the play resumes after the stoppage, not when the foul occurs. So in that situation, again, where green have used their legal reset, they're pushing forward. Orange beta makes back tackle, so yellow card foul. Just because the foul 
is now under delay penalty rules, it's not they cannot then legally reset between the foul and the stoppage in play because they've already used one. If they do that, then it would be an illegal reset for two legal ones. It's for when it only starts applying once the game resumes after the foul and the card have been given. Delay of game. So I apologise for the uh, bit of wordiness with what the rule book says on this one, but uh, I'm going to break it up a little bit. So what it says is delay of game is defined as delaying the start of the game by any means, so that's the new part to this, or attempting to stop or significantly impede the quaffle game from continuing. Um, so which is the same as it was before. The exact determination of what constitutes delay of game is at the discretion of the referee within the following guidelines. So these guidelines should be followed, um, but at the end of the day, it is down to the discretion of the referee that is doing your game at that time. So just because, so the main thing with delay of game is there are guidelines that should be followed. However, each referee's tolerance will be different. Um, so as a player, you can't necessarily use the oh last game's ref did this because like I say it's every it's discretion of the referee within guidelines. So within the extra guidance, the new clause has been added that um, if starters fail to take their positions after being asked to, then it's delay of game. So you're in that situation where the team you call for the starting lines, the team have now started to do the huddle or the team chant or something like that. You then call them for delay of game. If it's more than one player guilty, then it's a speaking captain penalty. If it's just one player that you're waiting for, then it would be just that player getting a penalty. Um, also, you can use a warning. So we strongly recommend that you do use your warnings um, for this, because again, it's, it's one of those extra tools in your armory as a referee. Um, however, must stress this, must stress this quite loudly, do not apply if the players or the team are late due to tournament obligations on other pitches, only apply if it really is the team's fault. So if the team decided they wanted to go and get a burger from the place across the road, that's their own fault. But if they're missing, if they've only got a squad of 10 and they're missing five of their players because they're refereeing on another pitch or held up because of an incident that happened on another pitch, do not call it then. Just sit and wait. It's not their fault. Um... And again, use your warnings, follow through um, where required though. So if you do use that warning of the player who's, um, or the keepers are going too slowly, or the person who's not at the starting line when you've asked them to be and you do warn them, if they do it again, or they're continuing to, if they continue to not do what you've asked them to do, that's when you need to follow through. Don't use warnings if you're not going to follow through on them, because that's when they become completely useless. Um, so just before we move on to the reset slides, pull that one back, um, MCP is going to give a little bit of extra guidance on this subject. Um, so I had to step aside for a second, I, but I don't, based on what's here, I uh, just wanted to mention the importance here is that it's not just when people don't take their positions. Another use of this is if people just don't show up, if the team's just not there. Um... Think of this as a halfway point between uh, between getting there on time and forfeiting because you're late. So a lot of tournaments will have that policy to forfeit when you're when they're late. You don't wait for that time to throw this. This is um, a this is a foul that happens when they've delayed the start of the game. Um, sometimes there you don't have a warning to give because they're not there for you to give them a warning. So this is a tool if they just don't show up at all or like only two of them show up, do use this. Um, it'll encourage people to be more on time, which is very good for tournament uh, functionality. Thank you very much, MCP, for that. So now we're moving on to resets. So this is quite a lengthy section. Um, so the rule book has slightly changed as to, oh, it's clarified about crossing the lines um, in terms of restricted lines. So the quaffle is considered to have crossed the restricted line when it moves from being completely on one side of the line to completely the other side of that line. So a player in possession of the quaffle is treated as an extension of the quaffle for the pur purpose of crossing the line. So even if I'm properly stretching out uh, with my arm and my leg to make myself you know, up to two meters long, maybe a little, bit, a little bit longer, you are, even though the quaffle might be at one tip of the two meters, 
the other like your toes would count as the other part of the two meters so if it completely crosses the line um so if your body is across the line you haven't crossed the line into the other section of the field um, it also means that the coffer doesn't have to touch the ground on either side of the line in order to have crossed it um so that's effectively where um there's a quaffle carrier who's running with it so it doesn't have to necessarily be on the floor so a couple of nice little pictures here so this person here with the quaffle is moving from left to right now you'll note that i haven't included the broom because the broom does not count in this um so that's the main reason why i haven't put a broom in there the broom does not count so even if this person's broom ended up if this person's broom was crossing the midline they still haven't crossed it even though they're part way into the midline because it has absolutely no relevance here so person moving from left to right um so as these move in even though part of the ball is completely across the line now the rest of the person isn't so that's what we mean by the extension of the quaffle so in this situation here yes all of the ball has completely crossed the line but the extension of the person it hasn't completely crossed the whole of the midline so the whole of the midline itself is a few inches thick as a plane and the bit in the middle is just a dead zone effectively so any any part of the body in that dead zone isn't deemed to have crossed so there now all of the body and all the quaffle has crossed the line so then going backwards the other way uh, I know I've put midline on all of these. It still res it still applies to the keeper's own line in terms of keeper immunity and as a restrictor line itself. So this time they're moving from right to left, even though they're still attacking from left to right. So again, even though part of the body is across the line, they haven't deemed to have fully crossed it yet. And even though nearly all of the body and only the ball is in the dead zone, and the fact that all of them is not now in the other heart of the field, they've still not crossed. And now everything is finally back across. So that's when they have deemed to have crossed it. So hopefully that clears that little change up um, with those graphics. So um, there's three different types of resets. There's completely legal ones. There's legal ones. And then there's times where there's not a reset at all. So there's a couple of dependent scenarios. So if something happens and um, it then depends on what happens next, whether it's a reset or not. So the first one is the defender strips the quaffle from the carrier and then the quaffle crosses the line. So if I'm the quaffle carrier, I've got the ball tucked in and somebody tries to steal it off me and it bobbles out and then goes back across my line. This now depends on what my team does as to whether it's going to be a reset or not. So if my team uh, immediately acts to get the quaffle back forward across the restrictor line again and note the word immediately. So they can't sort of decide for a few seconds whether they're going to do it or not and then go for it. It has to be, it's crossed the line, we need to get it back across now. If they manage to do it, then it's not a reset. Also note this is, they act to move the quaffle across, the foot quaffle forward across the restrictor line. If it goes back and they are, you know, somebody picks it up trying to get it forward and then somebody physically contacts them back again, just because they haven't crossed the restrictor line, it doesn't mean they haven't acted to, so you'd still not call it a reset. Um, however, if they do not um, have the intention of trying to get that ball forward again, that is when it becomes a legal reset. And so the second scenario is um, the quaffle carrier moves the quaffle across one or both restrictor lines immediately upon the start of a new drive. Um, so when they do this, it's not a reset. However, there is one piece in the rule book here that if the now quaffle carrier stole the ball during contact so they were contacting a player and they managed to steal it if they made significant progress going forward with the quaffle before they break the contact and reset it that is when it is a legal reset because they've made significant progress um before they've immediately sorry before they've reset it so two scenarios where there where it is dependent on what happens effectively um, either just before or just after the ball crosses the restrictor line. So another type of um, reset is the legal ones. So this is where one resetting action causes the quaffle to cross both restrictor lines. So if this happens immediately upon the start of a new drive, um, like we said before, this doesn't count as um, a legal reset because it's immediately after a new drive. However, what we're trying to go down the road for here is if um somebody would do one legal reset by passing it back across the midline which is absolutely fine if it ends up going back across the keeper's own line as well that again 
in terms of resets is legal and it's only one legal reset just because it's crossed both in one action doesn't mean it's two um and the other one is if the quaffle carrier is forced across the restrictor line uh, normally through contact so before it used to be if um the quaffle carrier was forced across the restrictor line they had to seek to immediately get back across it again that doesn't count anymore so now it's just a case of if the quaffle carrier is forced across that line that now counts as a legal reset. The um, third one that we haven't put in here because it's even though it's the most generic one, is the is the simplest one to grasp as a legal reset. Is if somebody just passes or walks back across the line with it uh, on their own accord, um, provided it follows the lay of game rules, obviously. But in terms of reset, that again would be a legal reset if they just carry or walk it across. So when is it not a reset? Um, specifically so it's not a reset um, like we saw in two of the dependent scenarios before but the other one is when a defensive player deflects the quaffle in the air and it crosses the restrictor line and this included this is including if it is deflected by a bludger so if I try and pass the ball um, across the pitch and um, a defensive player hits it like swats it and it goes back across our line not a reset and likewise if one of their beaters throws the bludger it hits the quaffle and goes backwards, even though they haven't necessarily touched it, because it's been deflected by their bludger, um, it's not a uh, reset at all, even though it crosses the restriction line. And there's also no dependability on if you need to get the ball back forward again with that one. Um, and the last type is the um, illegal resets. Um, the first one is just if there's a second legal reset in the same drive. And the second one is the if the... Um, Quaffle is propelled backwards across the restrictor line without attempting a pass or attempting to score. So if somebody's behind the opposition hoops and they go for the goal and it misses and it goes all the way back across the restrictor line, uh, sorry, across the midline, that is absolutely fine because it was an attempt to score, likewise with an attempt to pass. Now, if it was neither and someone's just getting like they've been contacting like a tackle and the ball, um, they're trying to just get the ball out to anyone and they just throw it. Um, and it crosses the line, there needs to be an eligible receiver and that person's eligibility is determined at the arrival of the quaffle, which basically means when it is significantly slowed and is nearly at rest. It's not applied when it's going. it crosses that restrictor line. So if it's going to cross the midline and it's still going quite fast and it's going to come to rest just before the keeper's own line, at that point when it's nearly at rest, you would then say, right, if the player isn't there, that is when it would be an illegal reset. Uh, it also does not apply to a loose quaffle. So if there's a quaffle that's just on the floor and someone bats it back or kicks it back, it doesn't count unless it was intentionally made loose. So if I was a quaffle carrier and I wanted to illegally reset it and I just dropped it to make it loose and then kick it, that's the loophole that that rule is there trying to cover up. So moving on to the next section, which is out of bounds, um, just a couple of smaller points um, with these next two. Uh, the first one is a player may go out of bounds in the process of attempting to prevent a ball from going out of bounds. So if the ball's running away towards the boundary line, somebody runs, tries to get to it and tries to keep it in bounds and they roll out of bounds or they step out of bounds, that's absolutely fine. There's no back to each penalty, no card penalties or anything like that because they're just trying to prevent the ball from going out of bounds. Um, and a clarification with the quaffle is when the quaffle becomes out due to being in contact with an out of bounds player, that player shall have deemed to touch the quaffle last. So if my player um, on green team that the keeper tries to launch it long to me um, and it goes over the boundary line where orange player is waiting to catch it if they catch it out of bounds that orange player is deemed to have touched the quaffle last even though it was thrown by a green player uh, and crossed the boundary when propelled by a green player so that is just tightening up that little loophole as well so moving on to snitch restrictions now so snitch referees please pay attention um, again, this is quite a wordy slide in terms of the rulebook uh, quotations. However, the rulebook quotations we couldn't really condense down or um, summarize because they literally say exactly what we needed it to say. So there's a few changes. Um, the first one is uh, snitches are now no longer to, uh, allowed to cooperate with a seeker who is defending them for more than a few seconds. So this basically means if a seeker um, runs across to try and um, stop the other seeker from catching. The snitch can work with that for a few seconds to help them stop uh, being 
caught. So they can initially sort of work with it, stand behind that seeker, and let them do their fending. But after a few seconds, they then need to run away. Um, the second point as well is don't count the few seconds. If it's four, if it's five, that's fine. But if anything um, that you feel is over the top or more than necessary, at that point you can then um, warn them or remove them if you deem necessary. Um, so this basically means um, a seeker is defending a snitch runner when they are putting more effort into interfering with the opposing seeker than they are into attempting to catch the snitch. So if somebody is trying to stop the other person from catching more than they are trying to catch themselves, uh, that's when they are classed as defending. And I know we would have seen times um, towards swim games where um, one seeker will be acting as a defender until they get rid of them and then they can turn around and go for the catch. Um, that play would depend on how quick, or how long they are standing there as a defender. So over, say, a 10-second period, if that person's putting in six seconds worth of trying to catch, four seconds of trying to defend, they're putting more effort in trying to catch so they wouldn't be called a defensive seeker so the snitch could move away. Um, but again, it's just one of those things, play with common sense, don't have to necessarily count and be um, absolute judge and jury when it comes to how many seconds they've been there, so they're defending. Um... The snitch runner must move out of the area being defended by the seeker, attempt to seal that seeker's broom, or otherwise significantly interfere with that seeker's attempt to defend them within approximately three seconds of, of recognising they are being defended. So that there, as it says in the extra guidance, isn't an exhaustive list. Um, they can come up with their own way of interfering with the defensive seeker, provided that it's legal within the rules. Um, and if they are in doubt as to whether the seeker is trying to defend them they should assume that they are being defended as well like we'll point bring a uh, point out in section 10 in a minute the snitch referee can also tell them when they are being defended so that covers one of the main uh, points with uh, seekers excuse me and snitch so the second main part of the snitch changes is yeah so they also now cannot throw a broom a significant distance away in any direction. So when if they steal a broom, they either have to uh, drop it, give it back, or toss it a, gently a short distance away. So no more than a few meters. But again, don't pace out those few meters. Just play it by common sense. If you think it was a little excessive, then just tell them, you know, give them a warning or anything like that. So before we give the extra guidance, MCP is just going to jump in with a few extra pointers on those two sections. Uh, just jumping back to the three seconds and counting it, not being too specific. Uh, you need to. You don't want to start going after someone for one or two instances of being a little over three seconds, especially if they might not have noticed, uh, because it's three seconds after they noticed that they need to move away. But if you see a snitch consistently taking five to six seconds um, after they clearly have noticed or after you've told them they're being defended to do anything about it, um, warn them that they are breaking their rules. Uh, and uh, because it came up uh, in just as I was talking in the, the chat, um, someone said, if the snitch runner does not follow these rules, what can be done about it as a head referee? Um, Egregious examples, you actually can replace the snitch runner. Uh, if it's repeated smaller examples, you can also replace the snitch runner. Usually for the latter, you need a, to give them a warning. This is a rare thing. This is a last resort. You try to correct the snitch before you do it. But if a snitch is not going to play by the rules, then you need a new snitch runner, and it is available as an option. That is, that is the consequence to a snitch runner who does not follow the rules. The only thing we have is remove them. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So the extra guidance, um, just reiterating what I said before, is um, for that first section there, it is not a complete list. There are other things that qualify as well. And the snitch may come up with their own way of interfering um, with the defensive seeker legally. But again, you as the snitch ref are the judge of that. If they're not doing it, like MCP just said, then use your warnings and remove them if you need to. Um, so we're moving on to this week's code. We Thank you very much, uh, Thomas from the RDT team, for this. Um, you can now um, either go to the link in the description of the video for the um, for the form, or you can scan our QR code, um, which 
I was mesmerized when he showed me that yesterday. Um, so that is this week's code. So NT13A November Tango 13 Alpha. Um, it's valid from uh, 36 minutes ago until um, just before midnight on December 19th, so just before, uh, so a few days before Christmas. Um, and again, if you need to apply for an exemption for this training, then just email gameplayicovsport.org and we'll try and sort something out with you. Um, a reminder that last training's code, the first week's training code, um, runs out this coming Friday, Friday the 27th at 2359 uh, UTC. So leave that there for a little minute longer just so people can um, put it in on the form. And we shall now move on to section nine. So turnovers, this is mostly applying to, this is all applying to referees rather than uh, any players who may be watching. So the rule says now, if multiple balls are to be turned over, um, simultaneously the referee should generally stop playing in order to complete the turnover. So again, this is an example of why third lunge interference is now going to be assessed as a delay penalty as a stoppage to be able to complete this penalty because there's now th a turnover of three different balls so even if it isn't third blood interference uh, and you need to turn over multiple balls the, you should generally stop play if the if they naturally happened um then just let it play on or if the players have done it themselves already when the referees have called for it then just play on um but again if it's going to be a little bit more difficult or it hasn't happened as naturally as you'd like, stop play, get it sorted, and then we can restart again. Uh, and the second thing is, um, once a turnover is called for a bludger, that bludger is unable to knock a player out until the turnover procedure is complete. Now, um, this um, can only be applied after the turnover procedure um, begins. And this is a turnover-specific rule. So if you're calling for a turnover not because necessarily of a penalty card or something like that um, because if it's a turnover due to a card so contact from behind and um, the card ne the ball needs to be turned over as part of the yellow card procedure this doesn't count even though it might have been a foul and then a, a beat using that bludger and then the stoppage and then the card um, that's not what it means this is for turnover specific um, calls so the example whereby so um, if you said, for example, myself and MCP are on the same team as beater partners, MCP tries to pass the uh, bludger over to me but gets beat before, I grab hold of it, so the assistant referee is calling for a turnover, and I then um, want to use it to uh, beat someone because I've not heard the call. If I then use that ball to beat someone, it is not a beat, it cannot be made, um, it's not allowed to knock out the player because the turnover procedure hasn't been completed. But if I give that ball to them, um, and then they either drop it or don't want it, they run away, they reject the turnover, I can then pick it up again and go for it. Um, because the turnover procedure has com has been completed there. Uh, so, ooh, I've hit click when I didn't mean to. I meant to unmute MCP because I know MCP has a little pointer to make in this section as well. Okay, so two, two small things here. One, the big one that people are going to be... Um, the one, one thing that's big, especially now that we've changed it, the third bludger procedure, this does not apply to the... the, the, the bleh, I can't talk today. The turnover procedure for a bludger blocking the knockout is only for those live ball ones, which means also these days your turnovers for a third bludger interference are not going to trigger this. However, none of this prevents the idea that when you throw it as part of a foul, that still can't result in a knockout. You cannot, uh, you cannot get a knockout immediate during or immediately after a foul as part of the as part of the fouling action. Uh, but that's its own rule. Um, so keep in mind this is for those longer delays um, where there may be uh, a few seconds or even longer between the foul and the stoppage. Uh, it doesn't go unless you, this will this rule here 914F will not apply unless you're in a live ball turnover one that's con that you're doing the turnover while play is ongoing. Cool, thank you very much. And now I can click the next slide button. 
There we go. So we're now moving on to penalty cards. There's been um, a few changes, a few clarifications. The main one is now that if a player receives a second yellow card in the same game, the player must be ejected after being shown the yellow card and their replacement will serve their penalty. So this um, now means that the second yellow card means an ejection, not a red card. So if I've already got one yellow card and I'm about to get a second, I don't get a red card as part of that. I get given a second yellow. I have to leave the field of play as I would um, for a red card, but I don't actually receive that red card. It's just I've been ejected from the game and my replacement will only serve a one minute penalty for the yellow card itself. So no red cards for double yellows now. Um, so there's been a few um, clarifications on simultaneous penalties. So the first one is if a player commits multiple penalty card offences simultaneously, the referee only adjudicates the most severe penalty of those fouls. So if I um, contact someone um, below the knees and from behind, even though I've contacted them from behind and I've contacted below the knees, that's two separate fouls, the referee will only adjudicate one of those fouls. So you'd only get one yellow card despite you've done technically two fouls. Um, likewise, if I was to, if I was holding a bludger and I simultaneously kicked one bludger, uh, kicked another bludger on the floor and, um, ended up kicking someone in the face while trying to kick, while I was trying to kick that bludger and the referee deemed it rex or egregious, I wouldn't just, I wouldn't get the blue card foul for interfering with two bludgers at the same time. I would only get what they would give either a yellow or a red, whether it's reckless or egregious for that kick to the other player. I'd only get that one foul because it was simultaneous. And likewise, if a player commits multiple directly related penalty card offences in quick succession, they again only adjudicate the most severe. So again, if I contact someone from behind and then uh, it slips down to below their knees, um, you'd still only give one card, even though they weren't simultaneous, it was in quick succession and directly related because it's on the same player in the same um few actions so again if i like I say if i did contact from behind and it went down to below their knee i would only get one yellow card for that um so examples again um from behind and well, in this case i'm going above the neck in one action one penalty card if i contact someone from behind then it slides down below the knees one penalty card for the two fouls because they're the same however if um, I contact someone from behind and then let go, and then I turn around and contact somebody else from behind, that's two different actions, so I would get two different cards. Even though they're quick succession, they're two completely different actions because they're on two different players. So um, if I did that, that would be two cards, or so two yellow cards in that case, which would then result in an ejection. So this is likely never going to happen, um, or at least in... 999 out of 1,000 games, it won't happen. But penalties for Seekers during the Seeker floor. Um, if a Seeker receives a penalty card during the Seeker floor, the offending Seeker is sent to the penalty box and their time officially begins at the expiration of the Seeker floor. So the most common way you'll see this rule come into effect is a Seeker false start. So if a Seeker tries to enter play at, say, 17 minutes 30 seconds, um, their penalty time officially starts at 18 minutes. So they'll effectively be in the penalty box for 30 seconds whilst not actually serving any penalty um, until 18 minutes when their penalty will start. And also goals cannot release the seeker before their penalty time beginning. So again, if they got sent in 30 seconds before the seeker floor ended and there was a goal that was scored, say, 17 minutes, 45 seconds, they don't get released straight on 18 minutes because their penalty time has not started yet. So... The player is only identified as a seeker if they have reported to the timekeeper as a seeker or they attempt to enter play as a seeker. So somebody's just got a seeker headband on in the subs box and they do something that's not a seeker specific foul because they haven't, unless they've fulfilled one of those two uh, criteria. So penalty time. Um, so first we're just going to quickly go over the penalty time, uh, penalty types and what they mean. And then we're going to go into... Um, stacking penalties as well. So blue, yellow and red. So this is uh, mostly as it was before apart from that yellow card change. So the first occasion um, is one minute, one minute and then two minutes plus ejection um, respectively for those three cards. Um, obviously we haven't got a 
um, subsequent occasions for a red card because it's incredibly, incredibly rare and very, very not likely to happen. Um, getting two red cards is possible, but again, it it would rely on a very specific situation, which really should never happen. So that's, we're not going to bother mentioning it. Um, so now that changed, you can see in subsequent occasions, yellow card is now one minute plus and ejection um, and the turnovers. Um, so the blue card turnover um, is only the balls interfered with. So normally with a quaffle, this happens. So this is why with a bludger foul, that's a blue card, the quaffle doesn't get turnover unless it's been interfered with. Um, but generally with a quaffle foul, that's a blue card. It's normally things like delay of game. Um, so the ball gets turned over as part of that. However, if the even if um, so, say again, MCP and I are on the same team. I've, I'm the coffee carrier. MCP gets a blue card for something like disrespecting a referee because the ball hasn't been interfered with. There isn't necessarily a turnover, so I would still maintain possession of the ball even though we've had a penalty card against us. Um, but with yellow and red, it's the balls interfered with as well as the coffle. So even if it was just a beat contacting somebody else from behind, the coffle still gets turned over as part of that. So penalty time. They are measured in game time. And um, players are released after um, their time has expired. Or in the case of blue and yellow cards, they can be released after a full minute has passed or a score for the opposing team occurs. Um, so that also includes if a player scores an own goal. So if MCP's on my team and he's in the, and he's in the penalty box um, and I score an own goal on purpose so that he get released, he would still get released. Um, but for a red card, you have to wait for a full two minutes of game time and there is no early release. Um, so the extra guidance, what we mean by balls interfered with. So this basically means a ball that is possessed or acted on at the time or uh, just after the foul. Um, and also, if it was a ball that the opposing team was prevented from possessing due to the foul. So if the quaffle was rolling away, two players were in um, competition to get it and one player pulls the other one's shirt to the ground, they were prevented from getting that ball, so they would therefore get that ball back. Um, so, releasing players, I've got four examples, um, which come, which nicely gives you an order for people being released out of the penalty box, because it can get confusing. So, advantage has been called and it's been, and is ended by a goal. Multiple players need to be given a one minute penalty card from the same team. So these are all from the same team. Um, the player who committed the first foul is shown the card first and has their time negated by the goal. Um, and any subsequent players to be carded are sent to the penalty box. Um, that is um, fairly standard. I think everybody knows that procedure, which is good. So multiple players are now serving one minute penalty times with the exact same time remaining. So uh, MCP and I are both in yellow card at the same stoppage. We've both gone to the penalty bin. Uh, in this scenario, the head referee decides who will have their penalty time ended first um, by a first score. So before we both go to the penalty box, they will either inform the they will inform the timekeeper or the scorekeeper, and they'll say this person will be um, going first. Generically, it will be the person who committed the first foul. But if the time of the fouls aren't known or it's very quick succession, the head referee just picks one. It makes no difference. Um, so just go with um, what you feel would be correct. Uh, but that's just a case of a first score. Um, so the next scenario is two or more players are serving one minute penalty time with different times remaining. So MTP has already been in the bin for 30 seconds. And um, I get sent to the penalty bin um, for a yellow card as well. The player uh, with the least amount of time left is released, is released first in the event of an opposition score. So if 10 seconds later... Um, that would mean MTP has 20 seconds remaining, I have 50. He has less, so he goes first. Uh, and the last scenario is two or more players are serving one minute penalty time, but with a different number of one minute penalties to serve. So I could be in there for uh, two blue cards and a yellow card, so I've got three one minute penalties to serve. And MCP has just been sent in with one yellow card. In that scenario, MCP would go first because he has the least amount of penalties to serve. So even though... I've got, um, I was in there first. My penalties don't get nullified by a score because MCP has less penalties remaining. So the order that people will get released, the first is uh, least number of one minute penalties. 
then the least amount of time remaining if they have the same number of penalties and if those two can't split it the head referee decides so hopefully that's uh, cleared things up for timekeepers and scorekeepers so um, multiple penalties so now penalty time stack even for red cards so previously um, the penalty card system was a case of say for example one player had 16 blue cards in and was in the penalty box trying to serve the 16 blue cards if they then say um, direct, um, swore at a referee to get a red card those 16 blues would be gone and the replacement would only have to serve that one red that has now changed so all the penalty time stack even for red so the scenario would be player a gets two blue cards so um, they've held the bludger kicked one they've completed a back to each penalty come back out and then done the same thing again so they've got two blue cards they then get another blue card for um, disrespecting a referee say for example on their way to the penalty box and whilst they're in the penalty box but before the game started um they have another go at referees so they get yellow carded for disrespecting a ref um and then they get red carded i don't know they push over the scorekeeper table in anger something like that um so now all of those penalties have now stacked so because they've been red carded somebody else has to come and take their place in the penalty box which player b will now do and player b serves all the time from player a which means six minutes potential total so for those first four cards the three blues and a yellow um they are served consecutively which basically means so as soon as the game starts they're serving that first card when either a minute has passed or a goal has been scored, that first penalty goes. They then start the service for the next one. Same again, when one minute's passed or a goal scored, you go on to the last blue card. And one when either four minutes have passed or four goals are scored or a mixture of the two, they then have to serve that mandatory two minutes of penalty time for that red card. Um, so the extra guidance is... Sorry, just one clarification I've just noticed. This here does not mean one yellow card followed by a second for flipping the scorekeeper table that is a direct red card um because otherwise if it was a second yellow it should be another one minute penalty um so this challenge is that if penalty b uh, sorry player b so the person who's now taken that six minute penalty um if them themselves gets a penalty card while serving that time they must be replaced so that the new player so player c now Will serve the player the uh, serves the time for player A so that player B can serve their own penalty. Uh, but again, that scenario will likely not come up very often, if at all. Um, so changing headbands, when can this happen? So this must happen when a keeper is carded. So as we know, they must swap the headband with a chaser before going to the penalty box. And if there are no chasers, they must swap their headbands with a beater or a seeker. Now speaking captains have a little bit of uh, extra leeway with this. So it may also happen on a key speaking captain specific card. So if the speaking captain happens to be in play um, and say they're a beta um, and they don't because they have given been given a speaking captain specific card. So they're taking one on behalf of something their team has done. They can swap out so they don't lose their bit. The, they can swap out with it except the keeper so they don't have to play with one beta down so they can swap the chaser. Um, however, they cannot do this if it's for a card they've committed themselves, so for example a contact foul or something like that, or they are already in the penalty box. If they're already in the penalty box as a beta, they then can't swap the headband. Um, penalty box considerations, so this is where players leave early. So if a player leaves the penalty box due to reasonably but mistakenly leaving their penalty time had expired, they do not interrupt with play prior to returning the penalty box, they shall not be penalised. So this effectively means um, and if they do that, sorry, their penalty time will not run whilst they are outside of the box. So, say for example, somebody has 35 seconds left, and um, a goal scored. The head referee calls it good. They leave as they're on their way back to hoops. So five seconds after they have left, brooms down is called, and um, the goal is called not good. They are not going to be penalised for leaving the penalty box. They then go back, but because there was five seconds where they were outside the penalty box. They still have to serve that full 35 seconds of time, um, even though they thought they were going to be released. So any time that that happens, when they go back, they have to serve that full time, even if they left early. Um, if a player leaves by mistake, 
but their penalty time is then nullified by a score. The goal can still release them, um, but to do it, for that to happen, they must still return to the penalty box to activate the release. So if they were on their way back to hoops because they left um, two seconds early, but they hadn't um, interacted with play yet, as they're on their way back, a goal scored. They must still then at the start of play go back to the penalty box to activate that early release and then go forward because they still technically have two seconds left because they left two seconds early. Um, but that goal then nullifies that two seconds and they can go. So last few sections now, um, we're going to cover ten point uh, section 10 and then go back to the last section of section 9 um, because the last se section 9 is um, ever slightly more elongated. So snitch referee duties, if they're acting as an assistant referee, um, there must be less than four assistant referees present. So if there's already four assistant referees and a snitch referee, the snitch referee cannot act as an assistant referee. But if there's less than four, they can act as an assistant referee during the seeker floor. Um, but if there's already four during the seeker floor, they must assist with watching brooms up and then leave the player area. And after the catch has been confirmed, if it goes to overtime, they also then leave the player area. So acting as a snitch referee, you have to watch for full starts on brooms up now. You can stop play for full starts on brooms up now. So if you notice a full start as a snitch referee, you are allowed to give your double whistle blast to stop play for that full start. And also the new thing as well is you can now inform the snitch runner of a defensive seeker if the snitch runner hasn't noticed or doesn't think that they're being defended. And finally, the alternate restart procedure. So I'm going to first of all explain what it is, and I've got a couple of graphics towards the end because um, there's going to be a couple of times in these next couple of slides where I'm going to use the term relevant line. The relevant lines will be shown towards the end with the graphics, so just bear with that. So what is the alternate restart procedure? This allows a chaser to move from the default location um, to a new location and resume play from there. So when the game is stopped and the player is about to receive the quaffle through, um, and when we use default location, this basically means if you were to get it from uh, advantage or a delay penalty, so... Um, that happy moment in a chaser's life when they get given the ball after a delay penalty um, without even knowing they can either they can stay at that default location where they would be now or they can move to a new location uh, and resume play so the new location is the relevant line uh, to the zone they would receive the quaffle in so it depends where they are on the field as to which line they can then move to so for a delay penalty the turnover points are where they would receive the ball normally or they can move to the relevant line and this is one of the main reasons why this rule has been introduced. It's for an advantage marker. Um, if teams decide to put a beater on that advantage marker for when game restarts, they can move to the relevant line um, if they don't want to be sat at that advantage marker anymore. So when can this happen? Ooh. So this can happen after a third, uh, sorry, after a penalty card or third bludger interference penalty um, has been given. But one of the adjudicated penalties must be against the opposition team. So even if your team has just been given um, three yellow cards, but the other team has been given a yellow card or a red card or something, and your team ends up with the quaffle, then um, because one of the penalties has gone to the other team, um, they can do this. They have to be receiving the quaffle outside of their own keeper zone. So if you're getting the ball in your own keeper zone, no go for you, I'm afraid. Um, and also if after an advantage call, um, if no goal is scored, if the goal is scored after advantage, then the ball is generally just going to start with the keeper um, from the other team um, for that. So when we say relevant lines, what do we mean? So this is going to be for the orange team in this example, um, as noted by an orange cross. So I can say if they are in their own keeper zone, so this section here, they ain't moving. So the next section along the field is the section within their own half but outside of their own keeper zone that that section there so if that's that's just an example place doesn't have to be specifically there it could be you know somewhere over here or here or here they then get to move the option to move to anywhere along the keeper zone line so they restrict a line back um, in this occasion so they can move from there over to there if they want then the next section up is the opposition half but not the opposition keeper zone in that scenario they can move to anywhere along the midline and then the final zone is the opposition keeper zone in that case you then inbound the quaffle 
from anywhere along the back line. So that, at that point, you become inbound, you're inbounding the cough, so you're subject to the inbounding rules. Um, something to note with this is that they have to make that decision immediately. So when you give that cough to them, um, you can say you stay in here or are you having an alternate restart? And they have to make that decision. Or they may, you know, if they know about the rule, especially towards the end of the cycle when the rule's been in there for a while, um, they may then want to make that uh, decision for themselves sh straight away. So um, for the first few times, um, they might not know about the rule straight away, so allow them a little extra leeway. But by the time it gets towards the end of the cycle, players will know whether they can move or not. Um, or if they try and move and they can't, you can just say, you can't move. Um, so, but they have to make that judgment immediately. If they're waiting for three seconds and they're, or they're trying to have a discussion with the team whether they should do it, you don't allow them to. They've got to stay put where they are. And for this final point, MCP also has a little bit of extra guidance um, for this topic as well. Yeah. This is less so much guidance on what the rules are as, as it is how to interact with the players. As, as Steve said, tell them, ask them which option they are going to take, but at the same time, especially when it's right on the line or early on, tell them their options. Just say, are you going to go here or are you going to go somewhere on the back line? Or are you going to go here or are you going to go somewhere on the midline? As a ref, you can speed things up considerably and reduce confusion by just telling them their options instead of just assuming they'll know. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Yeah, so as we say, when you talk to the players, especially towards the start, um, they'll certainly like you more for it as a referee. They'll um, like talking to the players is one of the main aspects of being able to get on their good side. Because if you then leave them into limbo as, oh, can I move? Can I not? Just answer the question. Give them the option. Because if you don't, and they end up get and they end up getting um, like the wrong end, like the back end of the stick for it um, through the play, like you know they get beat straight away or something like that, then it looks bad on you and that team. It's going to be hard to referee for the rest of the game. So I would say talk to the players and make sure um, that they know their options. Um, that doesn't just go for this rule in particular. It applies to any of the rules. So even for the one like we went over last time about the if you're wrapping a player on the ground and uh, you, you follow the set criteria, you can then contact them from behind or you can move around them provided that you stay within the uh, parameters that we set. Um, give them that option. Let the players know that that option is there. Um, because they might not know, it's, it's not necessarily a player's job to know the rules as in-depth as um, you referees are, um, are supposed to. Um, so that would be a good match control point to know. It would be a good match control point to make sure that you know these rules and know the player's options for them as well. Um, so hopefully you found that um, those two training sessions um, helpful. We've answered as many questions as we can. If you're watching this as a... Um, post live stream video we've enabled the live chat replay so any questions that might have been answered, asked in that chat that you might have have a quick look through um mcp has been going in there and answering them and say so if you have any extra questions that you think of after this video has gone out or after this live stream has finished please please use that form below um when we see how many questions we've got and the level of detail of some of the questions we'll decide whether we're going to put it out as a pre-recorded video or another live stream or even just as a pdf like we say it depends on the number of questions and how in depth they go um, please try and keep it though to rule change specific questions. If it's generic refereeing questions or something to do with the ref hub or tests or anything like that, please email gameplay at iqasport.org um, for those. Um, you may we've asked we've made name and email optional um, on the form. Doesn't necessarily just if you do give your name and email and ask a question, you may not get a personal response, um, especially if we're going to be using it as a question to be um, publicized so that everybody will learn from the question that you've asked if they've not thought of it or they didn't want to ask it. So yeah, please use that resource. We are here to help. Um, if you do have any other questions and you can't find that form or something like that, then please just email us, gameplay.iqasport.org. We hope you enjoyed that uh, training session. We are going to be working on um, the next training session uh, over the next few weeks. We'll let you people know what that's going to be and when that will be um, through the IQA website and the Facebook pages. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed. Please enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a very, very good uh, Sunday today or tomorrow, depending on where you're watching from. Um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your weekend.